So in a couple of weeks, we're going to have Easter. So I encourage you to invite three people for Easter Sunday because they're more likely to come that Sunday because it's the thing to do on Easter. So start praying for those three people that you're going to invite. Start praying for them now. It could be the cashier that you always see on ShopRite and they'll be smiling and you give them a little small talk here and there. You know, start praying for them so that when you invite them, they're more open to the gospel because you already have sent the Holy Spirit ahead of, of you to minister to them. Because Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. So our prayer should be, Lord, draw them by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you invite three and only one show up, it's still good. Why? Because if all of us invite three and one show up, we already double in size. So this morning, I want to teach on Jesus teaches on evangelism. Jesus teaches on evangelism. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 1. And if you read the New Testament and all the letters of Paul, and especially the book of Acts, you're going to find out that the purpose of the church is to go and make disciples of all nations. Coming together is a means to an end. The only purpose we come together on ch to church on Sunday is to worship God, but to get equipped, to get trained, to do the work of the ministry. So Jesus had already sent the 12 apostles to go evangelize. And now in verse 1, it says, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come or going to go. So he appoints 70, some translations have 72, ahead of him. This is six months before he gets crucified. So now he's getting more workers to, to preach the gospel, to share the good news. First the apostles and now these 70 that he sends out to go evangelize, to prepare the way where the cities where he was going so that they can plant seeds and minister to people. So there's always going to be a need for workers. And Jesus told the apostles that when he was leaving, going to heaven, he told them, it is for your advantage that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the helper of the Holy Spirit will not come. How is that more advantageous if Jesus leaves physically and sends the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus could only be at one place at one time when he was here physically. But if all of us have the Holy Spirit, can we spread the gospel even further? Absolutely. So every believer has the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So each one of us can go out and make disciples. That is more effective than having Jesus physically here moving from one town to the next. So he sends the 70, and I'm going to give you practical instructions on evangelism. Number one, pray for more workers. Pray for more workers. Verse 2, he told them, the harvest is plentiful. Now the harvest, he's talking about the world, people that are lost, people that don't know Christ. In other words, he was saying, there are many people that are lost, many people addicted to drugs, many people that are in alcoholism, many people that are sexually addicted, many people that are murderers and liars and thieves, many people that are self-centered. The harvest is plentiful. How many know that there's so many people lost out there? Just within our families alone, we can start a church, each one of us, if they would all get saved. So many people lost. Our families, you know, friends, and then co-workers, and then the community. So many people lost out there. So Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. In other words, he would send them pray, pray, pray that there will be people willing to go out and share their faith and evangelize because it's not an issue whether there's people lost or not. The issue is whether we're willing to go out and share our faith. So he's saying pray for more workers. Now we always have workers within the church, which is great. Setting up, you know, ushering, different things like that is great. But here in context, he's talking about workers in terms of evangelism, that they will go into the harvest field the harvest field is the world. A lot of people don't mind volunteering 
in the church, as long as it doesn't inconvenience them and puts them in a place that makes them feel, I'm using that word on purpose, feel uncomfortable when they have to be talking to sinners and sharing their faith. And a lot of churches, I, I see their programs and their ministries always for saved people, for people that already know the Lord. And here Jesus is saying, pray for more workers. How many know that we need workers out in the field? You know, there's no such thing as unemployment in the kingdom of God. In other words, I'm full. There's nothing for you to do. Pray for more workers. That's always been an issue when it came to evangelism. Not people in the church wanting to prophesy or move in the gifts of the spirit or wanting position. There's, we have plenty of that in the churches all around. But people that are actually want to take the Great Commission seriously and say, Lord, use me for your glory. Whatever personality you might have, but you might say, Pastor, you don't understand the cards I've been dealt with. Give those cards to Jesus and let him deal those cards. Let him work with those cards. Like I said, everyone has different personalities. The most introverted person would influence 10,000 people in their lifetime, according to statistics. So a person that never talks in their life, this is the most introverted will influence 10,000 people in their lifetime. And that influence could be towards the kingdom of God. So pray to the Lord of the harvest. And that should be your prayer. Lord, send me, but Lord, send more workers. In other words, Lord, bring people that are evangelistic. Bring people that want to share their faith. Bring people that are not ashamed of the gospel. Lord, send people that are fired up for you. Listen to what Warren Wisby says. Please know that it is laborers, not spectators, who pray for more laborers. Too many Christians are praying for somebody else to do a job they are unwilling to do themselves. Lord, send her. Lord, send him, but not me. I'll stay here and pray for you. I'll even fast for you, but you guys go out there. I'll be right here fellowshipping with my brothers and sisters. It's easy to pray for somebody else to do the job, and that's always been a deficit in the body of Christ. Bill Bright, before he passed away, he said only 2% of Christians share their faith on a regular basis. 2%. And all you have to share with people what God has done in your life. Right? If you don't know, write in a piece of paper. What has God done in your life? Write that, and that's your testimony. And then share that with people when they open up to you. And, you know, I was working, been working nights and driving to Boston. People talk to me. They start opening up. I got to share the gospel like three times, you know, this week. By the grace of God, there's people everywhere that are lost and hungry for an answer. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. And I love what John Wesley used to pray. He used to draw a circle, and he used to stand inside the circle. He used to say, Lord, send revival within this circle. In other words, start with me first, Lord. Set me on fire, Lord. Forget about everybody else. I need to be ignited by the fire of the Holy Spirit. And then Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 38, Jesus says the same thing. Let me read that to you. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the, the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, this should be our prayer. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed, number one. Helpless, number two. Like sheep without a shepherd. They were headless, which means no leader to guide them. Everyone that's out there does not know the Lord. They're harassed, helpless, and sheep without a shepherd. They need someone to come alongside of them and minister to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 37. Then he said to the disciples, again, reiterating the same thing. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. Is this important to Jesus? We need workers. Who's going to enlist? Who's going to sign up? Who's going to you know, put their name on the card and say, send me, Lord. Enlist me as your soldier. Enlist me to win souls. So the harvest is always plentiful. So he didn't say pray for the harvest. He said we need workers. Work. There's already people out there that are open to the gospel. But we just have to pray, Lord, give me divine appointment today. Lord, before I leave my house, wherever I go, God, 
You orchestrate circumstances that could end up talking to somebody about Christ. Is that your prayer? You just go along the way without realizing the people around you and even some people try to talk to you, but you're so uh, in a hurry and, and you go where you got to go that you miss opportunities. Every week we should be able to come together, put a circle around this church and ask, how has God used you this week? Have you witnessed to somebody? Have you prayed for somebody? Have you encouraged somebody this week? And if the answer is no, then that week was wasted in terms of eternal value. And every month, you know, if you think about your own life, God, has I have I witnessed to somebody, prayed for somebody, encouraged somebody? Have I done anything for the Lord this past week or even this past month? If not, you're not affecting for eternal value. It's almost, for me, it's a wasted week. You know, even though I'm learning, I'm growing, I'm reading the Bible, that's good for me. But there's people out there that need the ministry of the Holy Spirit that's inside you. Because if they die without Christ, they're going to wake up in hell. And God has given us those opportunities. So I just want you to ask yourself that question. Who have you ministered this week? Has the Holy Spirit worked through you this week alone? Forget about this month or the past year. This week alone, has the Holy Spirit worked through you? And if the answer is no... Change your prayer and say, Lord, use me, please. Lord, take whatever I have. I may not have much, Lord, but use me, please. Lord, work through me, Lord. Father, I pray for lost souls and begin to cry out to God. Father, use me as an instrument to bring the gospel across. Let my days be counted, Lord. Because we all want to be used of God. And number two, we are going into an antagonistic world. We are going into an antagonistic world. He says, verse three, go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. In other words, the culture is contrary to the gospel. How many know that? That we're going into a hostile environment. We're going to people that hate us, not because of who we are, but because of who we represent. Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify of it that his works are evil. That's the only reason they hated Jesus, because he testified what you're doing is wrong. So don't feel like if you're going to witness and, and, and God is with you, that everything is going to be fine. And that everyone is going to love your message. We're going into a hostile world. But he says, go, I am sending you. We go with the authority of Christ. The culture is never going to agree with the gospel. The culture is never going to make peace with the true church. Somebody has to compromise. And unfortunately, many believers in churches are compromising and caving into the world. And they lose their witness for God. They're no longer the salt of the earth. They have become a social club, a hangout where people can come and hear a couple of scriptures and go home in their sin and die and end up in hell. Somebody has to compromise. The church or the world needs to repent and come to Christ. So it's an antagonistic world. John chapter 15, verse 18 and 20. Jesus told his disciples this. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. If you were from the world and you partied, you drank, you smoked, you slept around, the world loves you. You're just like us. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So we're being sent out into an antagonistic culture. And then he goes on to say, remember the word that I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. So it's a hostile environment. But we have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the anointing of God to minister. And the Holy Spirit flows through us when we open our mouths. The anointing, listen church, the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit is to work. To work. To work. So you might say, I haven't been sensing the presence of God. I don't sense the anointing anymore. Maybe you have not been working for the Lord. Because the anointing is to work. You're saying whether you win somebody to Christ or not. But the anointing is always to work. Listen to what Jesus said. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me for 
to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to work. Not to feel goosebumps and feel good and, oh, I feel the anointing. That's wonderful, but it only comes upon you if you're working. And we see that in Acts chapter 4, after the apostles got filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, they got arrested, they got threatened, they went into a prayer meeting, and after they prayed, the place where they were was, sh was shaken, and it says that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Why did God continue to fill the apostles with the Holy Spirit? Because they were working. Without working, there's no infilling. There's no purpose for the power of the Holy Spirit. The only reason is for the power of the Holy Spirit is to be a witness. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witness. The first thing Jesus said when he met the disciples, come, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of people. First thing. The last thing he told them, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. What is in Christ's heart? That none should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. You can't read the Bible and get away from that. The whole book of John was, is an evangelistic gospel. John said in John chapter 20 that Jesus did many other miracles in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. And then he goes on to say, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing, you may have life through his name. So John wrote it as an evangelistic tool that whoever reads it will say, wait a minute, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God, and come to faith in Christ. Jesus sends out the 12 in Matthew chapter 10 before he sends out the 70, and he tells them the same thing. Be on your guard against people. They will hand you over to local councils and flog you in their synagogues, and we see that happen in the book of Acts. They got arrested. They got flogged. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, listen to this, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it is not you who's speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So when you start witnessing, all of a sudden the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you start flowing in the Holy Spirit. It's not you. It's the Spirit of God that has given you at that moment a fresh infilling of his presence to be a witness for him. But you have to open your mouth and put yourself in those situations. People want the power before they witness. You witness and the power will be there if you trust in the Lord. He's not going to let you down. He said, take that word. It is not you that speaks, but the Spirit of my Father speaking in you. Don't worry about what you're going to say. How are you going to argue? If they ask me this, what am I going to say? And I don't know the whole Bible. And I didn't go to Bible school. You know, all these different things that come into the mind, the devil tells you, yeah, forget it. Instead of saying, Lord, use me. As you use the apostles. These guys were uneducated and untrained. Rugged fishermen from Galilee. Jesus didn't even pick 12 from Jerusalem. The, 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 the standard of religion and all that. 12 rugneck you know, disciples, fishermen. Without, you know, any education or anything, they turned the world upside down. And the Bible says that they realized that these men have been with Jesus. That is the key to being a soul winner. Be with Jesus every single day. So the Spirit of God will come upon you. And that has happened to me constantly. And those who witness know what I'm talking about. That all of a sudden you turn into like the theologian inside of you rises up. And scriptures start coming left and right. And you got to slow down because... Is a barrage of, of scriptures that come to mind because the Holy Spirit comes upon you and he takes over. It is not our message. It is not our witnessing. It is the Holy Spirit that witnesses through us. We just got to be open and available and say, Lord, send me. Use me, Lord. And then number three, trust God to provide and avoid distractions. Trust God to provide and avoid distractions. He, he says in verse 4, don't take any money with you, nor a traveler's bag, nor extra pair of sandals, and don't stop to greet anyone on the road. In other words, I'm going to provide for you financially. If you're doing the work of the Lord, 
God has you. Because a lot of people struggle here and there, but a lot of times they're trying to figure things out on their own and they have God second or third. But he says, don't worry about money. Don't, don't worry about who's going to provide. If you do my work and you get out there and start evangelizing and put me first, I'm going to take care of you financially. I'm going to provide for you. Jesus teaches on worry in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 and 34. Listen to what Jesus says on worry. Why? Because he knows that us as human beings, we do what? We worry, my rent, my car, my bill, the light, the, all these different things. So Jesus has a whole chapter, a passage on worry. Verse 31, Matthew 6, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? And what shall we wear? For the pagans or the unbelievers run after all these things. I got to make money. I got to make money. I got to make money. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. Does he know our needs? Does he know what builders do? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of his own. Now, he's not encouraging to be lazy and that God's going to provide. You know, we work and we do our part, but you're not going crazy trying to figure it out and trying to make money and killing yourself and losing your family like a lot of people do. They work two or three jobs. Uh, they lose their family. The kids can't stay in them or anything because there's so much making money, money, money. And as the kids grow up, they turn on the Lord. Because they put money before that. So here Jesus is saying, don't carry anything. Trust in me. Rely upon me. When you go witnessing, I have you. If you put me first in my kingdom and my purposes. And what is the purpose? To, to make everybody believe in Jesus Christ. That vision statement that we have there. To bring Christ to everybody. That is the, the mission of the church. And like I said many times, being part of a church is nice because it gives us a sense of belonging. Being connected with one another. We have the same Christ. We can talk about scripture. Yes, we belong. But participating in the mission of the church gives us a sense of purpose. 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 It's great to get together, but what's the purpose? Participating in the mission of the church. Evangelizing. And many Christians are bored because they're not working for the Lord. And if they're not working for the Lord, like I said, they revert back. So they're always, and the next he tells them, don't avoid, avoid distractions. Look at what he says, don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Now that sounds kind of cold. Don't stop to greet anyone on the road. But Jesus was sending them into specific towns and places where he wanted them to go. So on their way there, they might meet, meet somebody that they know and start talking to them and, and get distracted from the core mission. So basically avoid distractions. Focus on the Great Commission. God wants us to be Great Commission-minded, to always be thinking about evangelism, to always be thinking about souls. That is the reason why we exist as a church. We're all born again. If you're here and you're saved, your name is written in heaven. You already sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You already been born again. Your sins have been forgiven. Wonderful. Now what? The purpose of God is to make disciples to win souls, to share your faith, to go and, and, and preach the gospel. Avoid distractions. How does this apply to us? There are many distractions in the world. You know, I know people that play on their phones for hours, You know, watch uh, sports for hours. So many distractions, not necessarily sin, but distractions. And some people have to get certain things on their phone to warn them that they've been on the phone too long, that they have to get off now. The devil will use anything to distract you from the core mission, to make disciples of all nations. And he doesn't mind, you know, churches having activities and programs and ministries for us. Everything for us, for us, for us. Forget about the world. Let's create programs for us, ministries for us. How can we get fed? How can the pastor call me? And how can they pray for me? And how can they bless me? Everything for me, me, me. We can do that. Ministry is just for ourselves and get edified and get built up. But again, what is the purpose? Is to go out and make disciples. So don't get distracted from the Great Commission. Don't get distracted from the purpose of making disciples. Now, that might look different for every one of us. Where you work, the people that you're around, your family members. I can't reach the people you're around. You can't reach the people I'm around. God has placed us in different 
places so that we can be an influence for the kingdom of God. Don't be distracted from the great commission. In Psalm chapter 90, verse 12, the psalmist says this. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, Lord, help me number my days. I don't want to waste time doing things that have no eternal value. And I'm not saying you can't go on vacation and renew yourself or go on a motorcycle ride. Oh, that is great. But people spend way too much time on things that are not going to matter for all eternity. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, Paul the Apostle says this, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise people, verse 16, making the most of your time because the days are evil. In other words, use your time wisely. Don't waste time in things that are not going to last. So whatever the Lord might be telling you, you know what, I need to cut this so I'm spending too much time on this. Like I said, it can be a good thing, which can lead us to where it's not a sin. So that means I can spend, you know, five hours on a video game. Oh, 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 six hours watching, you know, the NBA, you know, and all these different things. Those things are not sinful in themselves, but hours of that could rob us from the Great Commission. So that was a master distractor. Psalm 89, verse 47 and 48, the psalmist says this, Remember how short my life is, how empty and futile this human experience. No one can live forever or will die. No one can escape the power of the grave. Don't get distracted in what, from what really matters. Going into all the world and making disciples of all nations. You have extra time, spend that in prayer for people that are lost. Another prayer that God answered was praying for my nephew Elijah. Praying for him and interceding and he just called me out of the blue. I need to get back with the Lord and all that. And I said, you know what, why don't you come and visit us? And he was here like two weeks ago. These are prayers that God answers, but you got to be doing the work. God does not answer prayer just to make us feel good. It's for his work, for his purpose. And that's why I, I told you last week that if you want your prayers to be answered, Lord, do this for your glory. Not for me or to have a big church and to have all these people. God, for your glory, Lord. Do everything for your glory. You know, and so that was another answer to prayer. God is good. He answers prayer. But he wants us to get to work when it comes to evangelists. Think about the three people you're going to invite. Stop praying for them now. You have nieces and nephews that are not saved, that are going down the wrong path, that are doing crazy things. Begin to pray for them. Fast once a week and say, Lord, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit after them. No matter how dark it looks, no matter what they say, oh, I don't believe in God. Okay, we're going to pray and fast and see what God's going to do. We have to believe in the power of God. Greater than the power of the enemy. God transformed your life. Whoever thought you were going to get saved. Whoever thought God was going to use you. You know the way he's using you. Whoever thought that you would be a candidate for the grace of God. If people would have gave up on you and said this person will never get saved. And that's what happened to Charles Finney. And Charles Finney was a lawyer who led about 250,000 people to Christ. A great evangelist. He had revivals all over upstate New York. That he used to come to the church very skeptical that the pastor told the people, don't pray for Finney. He'll never get saved. The pastor saying that. Now you know where his faith is and his belief. He'll never get saved. He had the pastor convinced that he was too far gone. But then he ended up committing his life to Christ. Started evangelizing. And God used them to bring revival. And he has a lot of books out there on how to lead prayer meetings and all these. The God used them. But the point is that even the pastor said, don't waste your time praying for Finney. He's never going to get saved. And sometimes we hear people like that. Oh, don't worry about it. They're not going to get saved. So remember how short our life is. You want your life to count for all eternity. Like I was telling my wife the other day, look, we only live once. We're not going to come back. You know, I wish I was born with a Christian family and this happened to me. We're all not going to come back. In 50 years, we will all be gone, except the younger people. But in 50 years... None of us will be here. We only have one life to live. Use it for the glory of God. You're not going to come back in another family, a Christian, or hope things will be different and all that. You, whatever you have, you have. Give it to the Lord and say, Lord, this is all I got, and he'll use whatever you have. 
No matter what cause you dealt with, Lord, this is all I have. The Bible says that God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chooses the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. That's us. God uses that. And number four, don't force the gospel upon people who are not receptive. Don't force the gospel on people who are not receptive. Verse 5 says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man's peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. In other words, they used to greet each other with shalom. And depending upon their response, they knew if they were open to the gospel or not. If the person of peace was there, their peace would return to them. In other words, don't keep wasting your time with people that are not receptive to the gospel. Don't force Christ on anybody. We got to use wisdom. We got to use discernment. You know, and we don't greet one another with peace like that anymore. But you can talk to people and in five or ten minutes you can tell whether they're receptive to the gospel or not. You ask certain questions and the way they answer, you can tell, okay, they're open or not. Or are they resistant? You know, so don't force the gospel upon people who are not receptive. Jesus said if they're peaceful people there, they're open to the gospel and to the things of God. Continue, but if not, your peace will return and move on. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, it says, Having your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And that's what we bring, the gospel of peace to people. But if they're not ready or receptive, you need to move on and continue to pray for them. But don't continue, you know, witnessing to them and all that if they're not open. And number five, accept compensation, but don't seek luxury. Accept compensation or hospitality, but don't seek luxury. Verse seven, stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. In other words, Jesus believed in house evangelism. He sent them to homes. And that speaks a lot to today because a lot of ministry happens in homes. Very rarely will people come to a church building, but they'll go to your house. Use your house as an evangelistic center. Forget about the brand new couches. God will give you other couches. You know, because some people's homes are museums. Don't touch this. Don't touch that. And I'm not saying you don't take care of your house. You don't want people trashing your house. But to the point that no one is allowed to come in here. You can watch from the windows, but don't come in. Use your house as an evangelistic center. Again, the question, who have you invited over your house? Past week, month? And I'm not talking about saved people, unsaved folks. People that you know that, they would come for a cup of coffee. They would come for dinner. They would come for things like that. And I try to have, after every Sunday, somebody over my house, whether saved or unsaved, from another church. Somebody's always coming to my house on Sunday. Because we want to use it for the glory of God. So he's saying, look, people are going to, Compensate you, people are going to want to feed you and all that. The worker deserves its wages. In other words, accept hospitality. And, and a lot of times, some people are good in giving to other people, but they have a hard time receiving. They don't receive from others. And he's telling them, look, people are going to want to take care of you when you go to the house, when you minister to them. And I have found that in my own life, that as you minister to people, they want to take care of you. They want to do things for you. I met a guy in prison many years ago, and uh, I connected with him two years ago. And, you know, he owns a, a car wash company in, in Bedford. A lot of famous people go, you know. He said, you know, when you went to that prison that day, I, you got, I ministered. God spoke to me. God, you know, blessed me because of you. Thank you. And he said, whenever you want, you can come to my car wash and get a free car wash. He's been trying to get me to go there two years from now. Because he feels indebted that, oh, I got to pay him back because of the ministry I had in the prison. I haven't gone there yet. I might go, but the point is, if I start showing up every month and bring my car there, am I abusing that authority? People want to do nice things for you, and you got to be able to receive. And like I said, I might bring my car or Jen's car there one day, but he's constantly trying to get me, come, bring your car, we'll take care of you, don't worry about it. You know, and I might go just to bless him, because I know it'll mean a lot for him. You know, but then he goes on to say, the worker deserves his wages. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, it talks about, again, the work that deserves its wages. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, and that basically means financial, double honor, especially those who work hard at what? Preaching and teaching. 
For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox when it is threading out the grain. And the worker deserves his wages. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Ministers, you know, should get compensated. But even, you know, applying to us when we minister to people and, and you're witnessing to unbelievers and want to do things for you. Don't take advantage of it. You know, don't abuse that relationship. That's why he goes on to say, don't move around from house to house. In other words, stay there. And don't start going from house to house, in our language, freeloading in people's houses. And say, oh, that food was better. Oh, this person treats me better. I want to eat there and all that. Accept compensation, but not luxury. That now you're seeing this as an opportunity to take advantage of people and to use people. He said, don't do that. Number six, be accommodating and adaptable. And we're going to move quick. Be accommodating and adaptable. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. And basically, whatever they set before you, eat it. In other words, you're going to go into some people's houses that may not have the food that you like. Jesus is saying, just adapt. You know, change your culture for that person if you're trying to lead them to Christ. Don't be so stuck in your ways that I only do this and this is the only way it can happen. And, you know, don't be so caught up in your own you know, ways. Whatever they set before you, eat it. So you're identifying with people. And Paul said that better than any of us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22 and 23. When I am with those that are weak, I share in their weakness. When I want to bring the weak to Christ... Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in his blessing. So Paul, when he was with the Jews, was like a Jew. When he was with the Gentiles, he was like a Gentile. But he still, without violating the word of God and the principles of, in the scriptures, without violating that, but Paul said, I accommodate. I, I'm willing to change certain things of my culture. I'm willing to compromise in certain things. I'm adaptable. You know, when it comes to witnessing, I'm not so locked in my ways that God can only use me with this type of people. I try to find common ground with all people because sometimes people only witness to people that only look like them, that dress like them. So already they have a bias, and that's not good. We need to be accommodating and adaptable, like it says here. So you identify with people, whoever welcomes you, eat what is set before you. And then he goes on to say, heal the sick. So you're ministering to people, serving people. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So heal the sick and apply to minister to people. You're serving people. And as you serve people, they're going to be open to the gospel. Maybe they might need help. You know, they might need a babysitter and you volunteer. You know, and other things that you can serve people that would open doors for the gospel. And then he tells them, let me read First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. It says, I urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid. Listen to this. Help the weak. Not step over the weak. Not beat up the weak. Not talk about the weak. Help the weak. How many of you know there's weak brothers and sisters in the body of Christ? Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. And then he tells them to proclaim the kingdom of God. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. Be adaptable. Be flexible. Don't be so locked in your ways that God could only move in this way. And a lot of us who've been saved for many years, sometimes we can get caught up in the way God you did things in the 90s. The 90s was great. But things change, you know, but the gospel does not change. Methods change. How do we reach people? The culture changes, but we never change our message. It's still Jesus is Lord. It's still you need to repent of your sins. But the methods and the way we bring it about might change, and we need to adapt to, to, to the culture when it comes to things like that. But the gospel does not change. And people that are locked in their old ways that want the church to be like the 1990s, they end up becoming a museum because when people come in, they don't say it, but basically what the people get is, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You know, and, and that's not good. We need to share the gospel. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. 
And now we're going to move quickly. Number seven, walk away from rejectors. Walk away from people that reject the gospel. But when you enter, verse 10, when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you have been performed in Tyre and Sodom, they will have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, you will be lifted up to the skies. No, you will go down to the depths or to Hades. Now, Capernaum was Jesus' headquarters for ministry when he was in Galilee. He got raised in Nazareth, and then he moved to Capernaum. And he's saying, woe to you, Capernaum, because a lot of miracles were done there. So judgment definitely is coming on everyone who rejects the Lord Jesus Christ and will be condemned. So we see Jesus said, they're not, if they don't receive you, keep it moving. In other words, walk away from rejectors. You don't want to get into an argument with them or start fighting and all that. You just walk away. And then number eight, know that the Christian labor represents the Lord. The Christian labor represents the Lord. He says this, he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who, wait, he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So they rejecting you, they rejecting me. Whoever rejects me rejects my father. So in other words, we're representing Christ. So whether people are receptive, you know, that's great. But they, if they reject you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Christ. And the reason I share that is because a lot of people are insecure and have low self-esteem. And if people reject them, they take it personal. They didn't want to receive Christ. They, they laughed at the message. They mocked me, you know, and they withdraw and never witness to anybody because they took it personal. It's not your message. It's the Lord's message. If they reject the message, they're rejecting Christ. And as you walk with God, hopefully you mature in that area. That everything is off. Forget, I'm not going to witness to you. They shut me down. They didn't want to listen. They laughed at me. And then that person never witnessed again. You got to be mature enough to say, if they reject me or the message, they're rejecting Christ himself, not me. Don't take it personal. You have the, the cure. You have the solution. If people reject it, where well, you walk away and you keep praying for them and believe God for them. But you never take it personal. And a lot of people don't witness because of that. Fear of rejection. Number nine, working for the Lord brings joy. Working for the Lord brings joy. After Jesus gave him these instructions, verse 17, the 70 return with joy. Saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. You know why so many Christians have lost the joy of the Lord? They're not working. They're not working for the Lord. They're not doing anything throughout the week. They're not doing anything for the Lord. They don't start. They're not doing anything. You lose your joy. There's so much joy when you're witnessing to people, when you're in, in the things of God and you're working. You know, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm grateful, you know, for Celine wanting to start the ministry. You got to do something for the Lord. You only live once. Our time is ticking. You know, there was a man one time that uh, did this experiment because people live up to 70 years old. And what he did was, he said, you know what? I'm 50 years old, so that means I got 20 years to live. So he took, he, he added up or divided it and found out how many weekends he had left. And once he found out how many weekends he had left, he got all those marbles. Let's just say, you know, for, for, for my point, let's just say it was 2,000 weekends he had left. Every weekend he would remove a marble from the box to bring that reality that you don't got a lot of time. Your time is ticking. We're not going to live forever. You only live once. You go out all for the Lord the same way some of us went out for the devil. No shame in our game. Whatever the devil wanted, we'll do it. We're with it. Go all out for the Lord. People might reject you, mock you. Just go all out for the Lord. Go out swinging for the Lord, as, as we say in the streets. But it brings joy. The disciples were ecstatic. They came back with joy. And if you lost your joy, you might not be working for the Lord. You're just sitting in the church and waiting for the next service, for the next service, for the next service. That is a, a boring Christian existence. I tell you, and I'm the pastor, it's a boring Christian existence. Because now you're just going from service to service, getting fed and getting fed and getting fed and getting fed and not doing anything for the Lord. 
Work for the Lord. Stop praying, Lord, what can I do for you, Lord? Do you want me to start a ministry? Do you want me to reach out to, to the alcoholics? Do you want me to start, you know, something that would minister to the people? Do something for the Lord, and it will bring joy. Everyone who has lost their joy in the Lord, stop witnessing. Stop sharing their faith. So they return with joy. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And number 10, in witnessing, we have authority over demon spirits. He said to them, I was watching Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to turn on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you at all. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits or the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. In other words, Jesus was saying, casting out demons, that's no big deal. The greatest deal is that your names are recorded in heaven, that you are born again, that you have a place in the kingdom of God. It's a small thing. So we as believers, when we go out witnessing, are we going out with our own authority, with our own power? No, we're going with the authority of Christ. He says, I've given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And sometimes when you're witnessing, not that you go looking for demons, but sometimes when you're witnessing, a demon might manifest himself through that person. You have authority to cast that thing out in the name of Jesus. You're not going on your own. You have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness. And I remember one time when I was witnessing to a young man named Lee sitting in the stoops in Brooklyn, if you know what that means, the little stairs that people sit in. He was sitting, and I started witnessing and sharing that God loves him. And all of a sudden, he starts manifesting, saying, get away from me. He's mine. And all these different things. And I knew already I was in for a battle. And I started saying, I rebuke in the name of Jesus. And then he would come back and say, Peter, what's going on? And again, I will witness him. Jesus loves you. I knew I was dealing with a demon spirit, but that took about half an hour. And eventually he left him. And he says, I feel like a thousand pounds was lifted off my back. I said, you need to commit your life to Christ and walk with Christ. If not, that same demon of alcoholism, that guy drank a 40 ounce every day of um, beer by himself. Every day he had a demon of alcoholism that had him bound. And I told him, you need to receive Christ, because if not, that demon's going to come back, and he'll bring his boys, and let's go hang out there and make them even worse. And he did a little good for a little while, a couple of months. He was walking with the Lord, coming to church and all that, and then backslid, he got worse. But the point is that you don't go looking for demons. You go preaching the gospel, and if that, and that these things manifest, then you deal with it at that moment. If a demon manifests, I command you to go in Jesus' name. That is the power of the gospel. And that's why Paul the Apostle said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God to save those who believe. Here it is, this little Jewish man. He's going to preach about a Jewish carpenter who was crucified in the greatest city in the world at that time, the Roman Empire, the capital of sin, and the Senate, and the Caesars. And what is this little Jewish man coming into this grand city? He doesn't have anything. But he says, I got the gospel. I'm bringing the gospel because it is the power of God to transform lives. John Wesley was transformed by reading Romans. John Calvin by grace we have been saved. He was transformed by reading Romans. A lot of men have been transformed by the gospel of Christ. You this morning, have you been transformed by the gospel of Christ? What has God done for you? Where would you be right now if you did not have Christ in your life? Where would your kids be? Your family, if they didn't have you praying for them? And Lord, I know they're knuckleheads, but Lord, have mercy upon them, God. We've been transformed by the gospel of Christ. Why don't we stand as we get ready to close and commit your life to be a worker for the Lord. Father, we just thank you, God, that you call us, oh God, Lord, not only God to save us, oh God, Lord, but that you have a, a great work, oh God, for us to do, Lord. Father, for there's many, oh God, that are lost, oh God, Lord, the harvest is plentiful, Lord God. But the labor is a few, Lord God. And we ask, Lord, that you would send us, oh God, and that you will bring, oh God, workers, oh God, Lord, that are willing, that are willing, that are willing, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help us, oh God, to stop 
making excuses, oh God, Lord, and trust you, oh God, in our witnessing, oh God, Lord, that we would think about those three people, God, that we're going to invite for Easter, oh God, that we would start praying for them right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, Father, that you, oh God, would help us, oh God, become the church that you desire for us to be, oh God, Lord, that the great commission, oh God, will burn, oh God, in our hearts, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord God, that we will not allow the distractions, oh God, of this world, Lord, rob, oh God, precious time, oh God, from us, oh God, from praying, oh God, for our loved ones, oh God, and family members, Lord, from witnessing, oh God, from making that phone call to that brother or sister, Lord God, to that, oh God, friend that we know for years, oh God, Father, we pray, help us, oh God, to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom, Lord God, for we know that James says that life is like a vapor of smoke which appears for a little while and then vanishes away. God, let our little vapor, Lord, make an eternal difference, Lord, in this life. In the name of Jesus, that we will redeem the time, Lord, because the days are evil, Lord. That the days, oh God, are short, oh God, that we will maximize, oh God, every day you wake us up in the morning, God. Father, we would say this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. God, use me this day, Lord, for your glory. Don't let this day, oh God, be wasted, Lord, in doing trivial things, oh God, Lord. But use this day, oh God, to have eternal influence, Lord. Help me have divine appointments, oh God, Lord. Help me recognize, oh God, the need around me, oh God. When I see, oh God, the lost. Help us, oh God, Lord, be moved with compassion, oh God, Lord, because they're like sheep without a shepherd, oh God, Lord. They are harassed, oh God, and helpless, oh God. Father, give us your heart, Lord, for the loss in the name of Jesus, that we would not have, oh God, church as usual, God, without that burning desire, oh God, that you have, Lord, that you will, is that none should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth, Lord. Father, we pray that we would take these principles that Jesus taught, oh God, on evangelism to heart, God, and that we would apply them to our lives, oh God, that we would not be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of your word, God, that you would fill this place, oh God, Lord, as every one of us, oh God, gets working, oh God, for you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, that no one, oh God, here will be, oh God, on the spiritual unemployment line, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, but that we would all be employed, oh God, for your kingdom and for your purposes, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in each one of us, oh God. The work, oh God, that you started, oh God, Lord, and we quote Philippians, oh God, chapter 1. He who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God, we quote Philippians chapter 2. It is God who works in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Lord, work in us, God, to will, to want to do, oh God, for your good pleasure, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless, church. Love you. And write down, you know, those three names and start praying for them even now.